Um, if you take a look at e-learning, um, I changed the link to the office hour. Um, there was something wrong with the other link I had there. So just so you know, that link has changed. Uh, you can click it right here to join the office hour. But if you were trying to join the office hour and you couldn't get in or something, uh, that was the reason I, there was something wrong with that other link. I had to fix it. Okay. All right. So with all that administrative type stuff, let's just go ahead and. Uh, Professor. Uh-huh. I think I noticed at least on mine that accounting 380 uh, went away from my course uh, dashboard. I'm not sure if that happened with other people or not, but I know you said you were leaving it open. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, Matt, send me a, Matthew, send me a um, email on that and I'll ask them to reopen that, okay? We'll do. They, probably, they probably did cut it off because uh, I didn't ask them to extend it. So um, send me an email and ask them to do it for both these classes to extend it through to the end of the year. No problem doing it then. Okay, thank you. Okay, good. So I wanna go ahead and put us in full screen mode here now. And uh, we had started talking about uh, foreign currency and um, what we had done towards the end of class last, last time was talk about ways of mitigating risk associated with foreign currency. The idea being that, look, I um, have a have had a transaction, we say a company in another country, I'm gonna have to pay them back in something other than dollars. I think they use pesos, a lot of these examples. And, um, I'm worried that the exchange rates are going to move against me and I'm going to have to end up paying actually more in the US dollar if the US dollar loses in the exchange rate. And so there are different ways to mitigate that risk if you think the uh, currency is going to move against you. So we're going to start to finish, we're going to finish up this discussion by starting to talk about ways of mitigating any foreign currency exchange rate exposure you may have. And so we'll talk about, and I left this note on that we uh, sort of wrote in last time, we'll talk about uh, hedges and we'll talk about short-term hedges and long-term hedges. Uh, short-term hedges will really be the substantial part of this discussion. And that we'll have a future hedge, which we'll talk about. Forward hedge is really the same thing as a future hedge, but Forward hedge tends to be smaller institutions. Forward hedge tends to be larger institutions. We'll talk about money market hedge. And with the money market hedge, you could have excess funds that you'll invest to uh, cushion against any exchange rates that move against you. Or you could borrow money. And if the net uh, provides a savings opportunity from that borrowing, you may use a borrowed uh, approach if you don't have excess funds. And then we'll talk about options and we'll talk about put or call options and pretty much all of these really apply to accounts receivable account payable situations okay and then we'll talk briefly briefly about different things that could be used for a long-term hedge most of our focus is going to be on these short-term hedges okay all right, good. So let's go ahead with that as a reminder of some stuff that we talked about towards the end last time. And let's just pick up here and talk about future hedge. Okay, so let's just read this here. Future hedge. Let me see if I can get this thing. Something's in my way here. I need to get this out of here. I don't know where to put it where it won't be in my way anymore. It used to go away entirely. I don't know why it hangs around now, but anyway. Whatever. Okay. Future hedge entitles a holder to enter um, to either purchase or sell a particular number of currency units at identified of an identified currency at a negotiated price on a stated date. Okay. So the two key things here are price 
and date. We want to make sure that we can hold our ability to acquire the foreign currency that we need to settle a payable or to ensure that we get a certain amount paid back to us in a receivable. And we're looking at the date that that payable will mature, that receivable will be collected. Okay. And uh, so let's just go ahead and take a look at um, this last part here. Future hedges are denominated in standard amounts and tend to be used for smaller transactions. Why don't you go ahead and just flashcard that? Okay. And there's different applications. We're going to see the accounts payable application. I'm not going to really go into, hey, here's the account payable application. Here's the accounts receivable application because they are simply two different ends of the same idea, which is one case I'm going to have to pay and I'm trying to defend my dollar against changes in the currency exchange rates. On um, the other case, I'm just going to be receiving those dollars, but how you use the instrument doesn't really change if it's in a payable or a receivable. So let's just look at the account payable, okay, using a future hedge here. And we use a future hedge to buy foreign currency at a specific price at the time of the account payable is due, and it will mitigate the rest, the risk of a weakening domestic currency, probably uh, the US dollar. Now we also have accounts receivable application. Okay, let's just look at that. And a futures hedge contract to sell the foreign currency received in satisfaction of the receivable at a specific price at the time the account receivable is due will mitigate the risk again that we're going to be paid back in a currency where the dollar has lost, and I'm assuming a US company there, where the dollar has lost against that currency. So let's just look at this example. And I think when you look at this example, you'll get the strategy here. And again, if it was a payable, it would just be the opposite. I'm using this example, you know, the other direction that we're going to have to pay money out. Um, and I'm using this example versus that other one because this one has dollar amounts in it. Okay. So we've got this running apparel international US best retailer has international retail operations in several countries including significant business in Japan. Company management expects that all Japanese retail operations will generate and liquidate a significant amount of its account receivable in 30 days. There's the date. We're sitting there and we're saying, okay, we've got to make sure that we have the appropriate amount of uh, yen available to pay this off. And we're thinking that the uh, exchange rate is gonna move against us. So although the current dollar yen spot rate is one dollar um, to 98.02 yen. Company management expects that the dollar to yen spot rate in 30 days will be one dollar to one uh, 102.9 yen in 30 days, 30 days. So to mitigate this uh, expected uh, exchange loss, the US dollar relative to the Japanese yen, the company enters into a futures contract to sell yen at the current spot rate, the $1.98.2, okay? Now, what I wanna do though here is just to illustrate what's going on and that currently, okay, what happens? $1, okay, equals one point zero two and i'm not going to try to make the yen sign here. i'm just going to write spell out yen okay that's currently that's at the time that we um, enter into this transaction and have this receivable and what they're worried is in what in 30 days it is backwards what excuse me Oh, the current spot, right? Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, right, sorry. Um, right now, let me start over. It's what, $1 is what is equal to, what, maybe 98. We're not gonna worry about the O2. Yeah, and, and what they're worried about is company management expects that the spot rate 
will go to what one dollar is going to equal 1.2 yen so in 30 days so they're looking they're saying well we're going to have a loss at some point in time that we're going to be getting back yen that aren't valued uh, as much against the dollar so they lock in this price to control that risk that there's going to be that fluctuation against them okay 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 good now um Let's take a look at this next one. And um, I think actually what I did here, I think I did this backwards too, didn't I? One divided by the um, 98. Sorry guys, I think I'm doing this backwards, my bad. So yeah, one dollar gives uh, um, is going to be one dollar for one point oh two yen. It's going to lose a move against us versus what one dollar for the ninety seven yen. So to protect ourselves, we go ahead and we enter into that contract. I got it right. Ninety seven, ninety eight. Okay, good. Um, now, when we look at the uh, situation of mitigating transaction exposure forward hedge, uh, now instead of a future hedge, it's a forward hedge. And the uh, only difference there is we're talking about larger institutions that entitled the purchase to sell currency units of a identified currency at a negotiated price. They're similar, but um, uh, futures tend to be for larger, uh, for smaller transactions and forwards tend to be for, um, futures tend to be for smaller transactions and forwards tend to be for larger transactions. I guess I'm going to be backwards all day here. Okay. All right. Good. Let's take a look. And again, I don't go through the um, details here. Same logic. Uh, just different size uh, entities here, but they kind of go through some of the same steps that we've talked about here. Um, now we're going to look at money market hedge. And this is just another tool. There's no rule that says when you should use one of these versus the other. But a money market hedge uses domestic current to purchase foreign currency at current spot rate and invest them in securities time to mature at the same time as the uh, related payables. So there's two approaches here. One is going to be excess cash, and then the other will be, hey, we don't have excess cash, so we're gonna have to borrow funds. So let's just go ahead and look first at the excess cash example. In firms with excess cash, use money market hedges to lock in the exchange rate associated with the foreign currency needed to satisfy payables when they come due. Money market hedges for payable satisfaction include the following steps. And let's just go ahead and flashcard these steps just so you sort of remember the logic of this whole thing. So we determine the amount of a payable, determine the amount of interest that can be earned prior to settling the payment, discount the amount of payable to the net investment required, and then purchase the amount of foreign currency equal to the net investment required and deposit the proceeds in the appropriate money market vehicle. They don't talk about the fifth step, which is then one. Then we'll have the amount we need in the foreign currency to cover our uh, expected exposure. Okay, so let's just look at this example. And you've got this. Uh, this Duffy discount pinatas has a payable due to its Mexican supplier in the amount of a million pesos in 90 days. The current exchange rate is eight cents per peso and Mexican interest rates are 16%. Duffy has 100,000 in excess cash and elects to use the money 
for a uh, use elects to use a money market hedge to mitigate transaction exposure to exchange rate risk. And so they do the following steps, which we had outlined up there before. So determine the required investment in pesos. And they go ahead and the way they come up with that 1.04 guys is that um, if we're dealing with a 16% Mexican interest rate and it's 90 days, you divide that by four, uh, that gives them the 4%, okay? And then all they did essentially was say, well, if it's a million dollars or a million pesos, excuse me, that I'm gonna have to pay, I should put the dollar sign there because it's pesos. So we've got a million pesos. And we wanna see that that should be equal to 1.04 times X. We don't know what X is at this point. We have to do the calculation that you see here. So in pesos, okay, the present value of the pesos we're gonna need in 90 days here is 961,538. So what they do is they go ahead and they purchase 961,538 pesos and they use $76,000 since it's what, eight cents per peso. So they go ahead, they invest that peso at the Mexican interest rates and that will grow to what? to the 80,000 that they will need to settle that payable when it comes due. And so they were able to, um, you know, keep that 76,923 that they were gonna have to pay at the date of the transaction. They keep that and that's what they have to pay out in 90 days. Now, you know, if the uh, peso doesn't do what they think it's gonna do, then they made a little extra if the peso goes even worse against um you know the dollar then um you know then they're gonna not quite save as much but at least they're doing their best to hedge against that so it doesn't it's not like it has to turn out exactly the way the um, they anticipated okay now if they're in a situation where they don't have excess funds to do something like this they can still use a money market hedge to borrow money. And as long as there's a spread there between what they're having to pay on interest to borrow the money and the change in the exchange rate, they can still uh, mitigate some of that loss. Okay, so let's just take a look. Firms that do not have excess cash follow the same procedures, okay? But they first have to borrow the funds domestically and then invest them internationally. So they're gonna borrow dollars, take those borrowed dollars and invest those internationally. So go ahead and uh, make that flashcard. And let's look now at the example where they're gonna have to borrow funds. So let's take a look. So Duffy discount pianos is payable to its Mexican suppliers in the amount of a million pesos in 90 days. The current exchange rate is 0.8 per peso. Same facts as before in terms of the amounts and the uh, exchange rate and the Mexican interest rate. And then they start to tell us, which they didn't mention that previous problem, interest rates are 6% in the US, okay? And Duffy computes that it must borrow 76,923 to use the money market hedge to mitigate the transaction exposure. Now, that 76,923 guys is that same number that we had determined here before. So that's still what they need. But instead, now they're going to have to borrow that 76923 Okay. Um, they have no excess cash. So they borrow that money for 90 days. Okay. So what happens? They're taking, and they give us this number here, but they don't really show us um, what we were supposed to do with that number. But you take this. 76,923, I'm just gonna write it in. And we multiply that times 0 0.06. And then the calculation is 90 
divided by what? And in accounting, guys, we usually use for these kind of things a 360 day year. And so if you look, they're going to have to pay $1,153, $1,153, okay, and 84 cents, that's the interest, right? And then you go ahead and you add that on to the fact that they had to put up front initially, or they had to borrow this 76923 I mean, if they had paid it at that date, that's what it would have cost them, right? It was a 76923 And so you go ahead and you take the 78000 076.84 when you add those two together that's how they came up you know they rounded it up that's how they came up with that number the interest that you had to pay of course you had to pay this if you had the cash you would have had to pay the 76,923 okay they make it sound like you know the payable was absolutely 80,000 that's what they expected that it would be again this doesn't necessarily turn out exactly the way they were anticipating. Okay, question. All right, good. Let's take a look at how we can use um, option hedges now. Okay, and basically we're going to look at how you can use a call option, how you can use a put option to protect yourself against these uh, currency fluctuations. So um coming over here the currency option hedge gives the business the option of executing the contract or purely settling in its originally negotiated transaction without the benefit of the hedge depending on which approach is more uh favorable so this is a little better and that you're not having to borrow the money I, I mean i guess it's a little better than the money market and that you're not having to borrow the money and then be locked into the outcome and uh, then things don't go the way you thought they were and you're still locked into that transaction here you're really just purchasing the uh, option and if the option is not favorable to you just let the option expire now the cost of the option you'll lose there but uh, at least you uh, didn't have to enter into the entire uh, transaction okay so a call option is an option to buy the currency at a particular rate. And um, similar to future contract, the business plans to buy foreign currency at a low rate in anticipation of foreign currency strengthening in comparison to their domestic currency. Okay, so make sure that you understand that a call option is an option to buy. Okay, make sure you've got that because otherwise it gets a little bit um, difficult to answer any of the questions. And um, go ahead and flashcard that we will either exercise the option or let it expire. Okay. Now you come over to the next page and note here that if the option is less than the exchange rate at the time of settlement, the business will exercise the option. If the option price is more than the exchange rate, we will simply let that option expire, which we've kind of already said that. I don't know that we need to read that again. But then, although option premiums are used to compute any net savings associated with the option, they are sunk cost and irrelevant to the decision. So you don't go ahead and exercise the option because you say, well, I paid this much for the option, so I must exercise it now. You look at to see if the option's in, essentially in the money at the time that you're uh, settling that. If it is, you'll exercise it. If not, you'll just simply let it expire, okay? But let's look at uh, this example here, and I think uh, it's useful, guys, when you're going through and you're making your flashcards. I think it's helpful to reread these options, uh, these examples at that time, because I think they're pretty helpful. So. Garrett International, again, million pesos, due in 30 days, and um, it's eight cents to the peso, but they're thinking that the peso will 
strength strengthen and it's going to be 10 cents to the peso 10 cents to the peso so what do they do they go ahead now and instead of a forward contract they're going to go ahead and they're going to pay five cents or 0 0.005 so it's that five percent of one cent or something stupid like that they pay 0 0.005 dollars let's just do it that way and start instead of trying to turn it into cents uh, to secure a call option to buy a hundred thousand pesos in 30 days for um, 0 0.08 pesos thus protecting uh, their position okay now in this um, question here they ask you well what was their savings and again, guys, you don't know that it's going to be the 10 cents, but they just assume that it comes true exactly the way they said. So they would have had to come up with what, with $100,000. They have this option price of what now of eight cents, but they had to pay uh, this 0 0.005 dollars, whatever, uh, to get to the um to get the premium so really the total that they had to pay to settle this was 0 0.085 and so they saved themselves 15,000 by entering into this option even though the option cost them 0 0.005 dollars uh it would have been much worse if they hadn't done this because they would have had to pay 10 cents on the dollar so it cost them 85 cents on the dollar or 0 0.85 cents, not 85 cents, 0 0.85 cents. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and when you look at this situation where you let the option expire, okay, and they did it this way where they went ahead and um, did, well, the, the thing stayed the same, but you still paid that 85, so you lost 5 cents. Or, or, or 0 0.005 dollars, or you could have what, you could have just gone ahead um, and you could have just taken this times what, the 100,000 pesos and you would have come out with the same number. Okay. So Professor, mm -hmm. premium, premium five cent is this kind of it's not five cents it's point zero zero five yeah or is zero zero five is yeah. this kind of the the fee that we had to buy the call option right um yes that's what we paid for that call option yep the option's not free you have to pay something for it mm, yeah and so if that, we if we don't exercise the option, we just pay the premium dollar plus. Uh, no, it, it basically you had to pay at the date that you bought the option, you had to pay for it, right? So you, you're paying money to get the option to then uh, call the, the currency you need at a certain price, which was 0 0.08. So in case the the rate is lower than the option price, do we need to exercise the option or we no. have? No, that was the point. We were worried that it was going to be 10 cents. It stayed at point at eight cents. So it doesn't do us, we don't need to exercise the option to get that zero eight that we want. So as long as it's under, 10 cents, we're not going to exercise that option. Yes. Okay. Now, I guess it can go all the way up to nine cents or something, you know, and, you know, but it, you know, so we'll still lose in that situation. We were, but, you know, we were willing to take that exposure. This was sort of where we're saying, well, we don't want it to go here. And so we want to lock in this price but it cost us this if since this is what if this is equal to or less than the option price we just let it expire but we still had to pay that right for the option hello yeah 
Yes. Okay. Okay, good. Okay. Um, and then uh, if you go over to the next page, um, they apply it to uh, currency option hedges to receivables. Um, I don't think it's necessary for us to go now to say receivables. We can skip this because it's just the other side of the equation of a payable. Okay. Okay, good. Then we come over, just moving along, mitigating with uh, look for long-term contracts. Okay, and um, we have a long-term forward contract. Okay, and uh, basically they're set up for transactions that are going to be over longer periods. And then you can also have currency swaps. You can have currency swaps between two firms with coincidental needs. Financial intermediaries offer swaps through a broker. And then you can do something like a parallel loan. Okay, so all they do is give us some definitions here. I don't think we need to spend uh, a whole lot of time with these either. All right, so let's just go ahead and take a look at our first set of questions for tonight. Okay, and I will open up the poll and give you the full two minutes or so to look at this first question. Okay, guys, um, let's go ahead and take your selection. I was looking at the uh, group here. We've got 18 folks in here today and I'm seeing 15 answers. That means I'm back to the situation where I've got three or so people logging in just to hear the soothing sound of my voice, I guess. Um, so, you know, go ahead and take your selections. Okay. and. Um, when we look at this, we've got what we've got 73% uh, of us or so got this right. Um, so let's just go ahead and take a look at this particular question. And this question is really almost saying, hey, can you kind of speak the language here? Can you speak the terminology, right? Okay. 
So they say if the dollar of the euro rises, which of the following will occur? And as you saw, A is the correct answer, okay? So let's start from the bottom and look at this. Well, first of all, you're gonna say to yourself, well, what does that mean? If the dollar, the price euro rises, that means that it's going to take more US dollars to do what? To buy euros, right? Price goes up, you gotta give up dollars to get euros. That means you have to give up more dollars to buy uh, euros. So the first one I would get rid of here is C. The euro will buy fewer European goods. There's doesn't affect your ability to buy European goods, um, you know, with euros against the dollar. Okay. Look at D. The euro will buy fewer U.S. goods. No, because you're able to get dollars with fewer. <laughs> you're able to get dollars with fewer euros, so that 10 times fast. And so the uh, euro will buy more U.S. goods because you'll be able to give up less euro, get more dollars to buy more U.S. goods. The euro depreciates against the dollar, you know, because we said when you think, when you first read that, you have to think to yourself, well, I'm going to have to use what? More dollars to buy euros. So the dollar has depreciated against the euro. Okay, purely terminology here, guys, okay? And, um, you know, it's not something that you wake up in the morning thinking about. So you're gonna have to flashcard some of these things, and then you're going to have to um, think in terms of, well, how much of one currency is it gonna take for me to get the other currency? And that's how you start to evaluate some of these questions, okay? Who are all these people in the class? I don't remember having 19 people in this class. Okay, all right, let's go ahead. I guess it's, you know, the most happening class at Golden Gate University. Everybody's trying to tune into it. Okay, let's go ahead and let's take a look at uh, this next one. I know when a choice is made after 15 seconds, I guess the person, while well, I was explaining, read question two, decided what they wanted for question two, and then got it wrong. Rather than listen to what I was saying about the question two. So, I mean, about question one. So don't get cocky. Hang in there. I'm going to give you two minutes. There's no reason why you need to hurry up to make the selection. Listen to what I'm saying about the previous question. This might help you with the next one.
Okay, guys, go ahead and take your selection. I've got those same uh, two people or so that never seem to want to answer the question. Um, don't get me into where I have to start taking attendance. Okay, so um, I'm going to end the poll and uh, taking a look at the results here. Most of us got it right, but 47% uh, is uh, not exactly what we're looking for here. Okay, but that's okay. These are a little bit hard questions. So um, we're going to use a lot of flashcards around this stuff. And then we're going to have to start to think about what the words in the question mean in terms of the ability to acquire one currency for another. So it says, what is the effect when a foreign competitor's currency becomes weaker compared with the US dollar? So that means what? That it's going to um, take uh, more of the foreign currency to purchase the dollar or you could take it that and say less dollars to get the foreign currency. Now, what happens if we're competitors, then we're competing. What are we competing for? Are we playing soccer here? What are we competing? Market share, right? Demand. We're competing for customers, right? Yeah, we're competing for customers. So what does that mean? Okay. Now we've seen already that the answer is A, but I want to show you a couple of things. Um, first off, they say in choice B that the foreign company will be at a disadvantage uh, in the US market. And then they say in D, it is better for the US company. Are those the same answer? No, if, they're no. yeah, kind of. if, if they're competitors and if it's the foreign company is at a disadvantage and the U.S. company is an advantage, that's the same answer. So you start to look at that and you start saying, okay, so it doesn't look like it's better for the U.S. company and it doesn't look like the foreign company is at a disadvantage. The foreign company is at an advantage because what? It's going to basically take more um, of the uh, foreign currency to purchase the dollar. So what's going to happen? Now, um, nobody's going to want to get the dollars to buy the US product. So that's going to put the foreign company at an advantage, right? Not a disadvantage and not an advantage for the US company. And the fluctuation of the foreign currency exchange has no effect. Come on. That's nonsense. Obviously, these fluctuations have effects, or why are we even talking about it? Question? Okay, so you want to try to start to handle these problems in this manner, where you're sort of sitting here and you're thinking about, well, what does it mean? How many is going to take me more dollars to get the foreign currency? less dollars to get the foreign currency, and then how does that translate into the ability to acquire the goods? Okay, okay, good. Let's take a look at number three. Well, I was looking at that one like uh, buying from the US with a different currency, trying to get a US dollar. Um, I'm having a hard time hearing that. Can you repeat that? It can not muffle as much. Can you do something? Oh, no. I was saying I was looking at it from a different perspective on a different side until you just explained it. And now I understand it more. Okay. Okay. Good. Great. Look, like I said, nobody wakes up in the morning. Well, what happens if the dollar week hits? I mean, there are people who do that. That's their whole life is doing this kind of work. But... For the most part, you know, um, CPAs don't generally wake up in the morning worrying about this unless they're tasked with something specific about it. Um, you know, the BEC part of the exam is probably the part of the exam that's going away. And it is the part of the exam that's going away in 2024. I think the examiners realize, you know, that they probably went too far with some of these things they're asking uh, potential CPAs to get involved in. Um, so unfortunately, we're not going to wait until 2024 to take this test. 
And so uh, what you're going to need to do, guys, is really flashcard the hell out of this and then get used to that thought process. Because a lot of times it seems backwards. When I first read some of these questions, I'm like, wait a minute, this seems like the opposite. So you think through the whole process. So try to do that as much as you can on these. Yeah, that's, that's like my main problem, like reading one and picking it. I know you uh, you keep preaching that, but it's kind of hard to break that when you've been doing it for so long. Well, for the last two questions, if you read one and picked it, you would have got it right because <laughs> they were both A, but unfortunately that strategy doesn't work well uh, on the exam. You know, sometimes I hear, you know, like on the uh, Facebook, Becker page, I hear people say, yeah, well, when in doubt, pick C. And I'm always like, no, when in doubt, and if you have to guess, think to yourself, have I picked a lot of A's so far? Have I picked a lot of B's? Have I picked a lot of C's? Have I picked a lot of D's? And then do the opposite. Pick the one that you haven't uh, used much letters up of at that point in time, if you can, if you can go through that thought process. Okay, good. Let's take a look at um, the poll here. And again, we still got that annoying group that's not answering the questions. And um, let's just take a look at um, question three here. And yeah, most of us got it right. Okay, 75% of us. And so let's just take a look at this one. The correct answer is C. And um, Platinum Company has, re has a receivable, correct answer is C here. Uh, Platinum Company has a receivable due in 30 days for 30,000 euros. The treasurer is concerned that the value of the euro relative to the dollar will drop before the payment is received. And so, hey, we thought we got whatever dollars are worth the 30,000 euros. And if the uh, dollar drops against the euro, then we're not getting as many dollars back, right? So what should Platinum do to reduce the risk by 30,000 euros now? Well, that won't necessarily help you because then it's gonna still drop at some point in time, you're lost on that. Enter into an interest rate swap, that's nonsense. Platinum cannot effectively reduce the risk. Yes, they can, that's a lot of what we've been studying here. And so enter into a forward contract to sell 30,000 euros in 30 days, and I can sell those at a particular dollar amount. And so I protect myself um, that when I get the 30,000 euros, whatever they're valued against the dollar, I'll be able to do what? Get the price that was the case at the time of the transaction. So I protect myself as much as I can against the fluctuation in the direction I think it's gonna go. Okay. Okay, good. All right, guys, so I'll tell you what, let's do this since we're done with chapter two at this point. Why don't we go ahead and do the break a little bit early, okay? But that way, um, you know, we don't have to, we can kind of clear our heads of this foreign currency stuff and go ahead and pick up with uh, chapter two after the break. So I'm showing a little before six. Why don't we go ahead it's kind of an odd time, but um, why don't we go ahead and come back at 6.05, okay? And we'll pick up with chapter two. I'm going to pause the recording, guys. Somebody remind me to start it up again when we come back. Okay, guys, let's go ahead and... Uh, pick up where we uh, left off now or get into chapter two. Uh, before we do that, I do want to remind you that um, we have the Security Exchange Commission guest speaker opportunity tomorrow. Uh, that will run from six to about 7.30, I suspect, um, depending on the number of questions and you're, uh, of course, encouraged to ask questions, 
as part of that, they're just going to be talking about the SEC's role in ensuring um, you know, ethical behavior in the accounting and auditing arena. So um, again, you're, you're more than welcome to join that, or you're gonna have to pick one. You're more, well, more than welcome to come to the one tomorrow. Uh, next week will be GAO. Week after that, I believe is going to be PWC. I'm pretty sure they've committed to come and speak to us. And then uh, our last week, eight five, we'll have the city and county of San Francisco coming. Um, there's also potential, uh, I did get an acknowledgement from the public uh, company accounting oversight board, PCAOB, that they will look into potentially coming as well for one of those nights um, after the first speech. And then there's also uh, a chance that the uh, State Board of Accountancy uh, will come and speak to us about their enforcement actions. So uh, stay tuned for some of those other opportunities, um, but you need to pick one and then do a quick little write up uh, about your observations. And I put, posted up last time the rubric is the, the certain questions I want you to think about and answer for those. Okay, any question on that? I thought you had mentioned that PWC or someone was coming back a second time as well. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Um, they will also be on, somebody got that date. It's not in the top of my head. You said Thursday, the 29th. No, that there. That's the, the. We're asking about the second one. Um, do I have that? Because I wrote, I wrote down. You, you mentioned Thursday. Well, they're coming on the 29th, but then Matthew's asking about a second date that they're going to come, and that's correct. So they're coming the 29th, but I'm trying to figure out the other date that. Uh, they're potentially going to come. So I don't have that at the top of my head, but um, I can I can get that for you. Let's see. Let's just do it now. And building up um, more and more tasks for me to do here. Monday. It's a Monday. August 9th. Uh huh? August 9th? Okay. Okay, good. Monday, August 9th, Matthew, is the other day, but that's going to be in the morning. Right. What time to what time? 10? To 12, almost. 10 to 11.50, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. I think I'll use the same Zoom link for all of those. Well, actually, I take that back. There'll be a different Zoom link. Did I, did I mention that? I didn't think I offered that one, did I? Now I'm getting confused. You, yeah, just one for all of them. I didn't know that I offered the second PWC. Oh, yeah, I did. Okay, um, so yeah, so I've got to, um, and then I haven't put in there yet, PWC will also be on the 29th. Um, yeah, so um, I'll have to give you a separate link for that one though. Okay, and the one that's not on there yet is the one where they're talking about what they would require documentary wise for being hired, correct? Not for being hired, but once you're hired, um, you know, they're going to start asking you and it's pretty much, you know, similar for all CPA firms. You go in a CPA firm, they're going to ask you for your bank accounts, your spouse's bank accounts, your, um, you know, information about any loans you have, all of these things. Um, to ensure that they don't put you, you know, what are your investment holdings? to make sure that they don't put you on an engagement where there's a conflict of interest, right? And you maintain all that data. And they'll probably talk about what they do, um, you know, periodically after you're hired to make sure 
that you're maintaining your independence. So it's mostly focused on independence. Okay, and that's, that, that's on the other date that's not posted there currently. That's correct, yeah, that's on the 29th. Because when I put this up and then I just found out Monday that they're gonna do the, they said they could do the 29th. Gotcha. And then maybe PCAOB. I don't know if I can record these. Um, I'm not in a position to tell these folks that they have to let me record them. Uh, however, the PWC one on eight, nine, he's generally pretty flexible letting me record it. But in terms of these other ones, I have to ask them. I haven't asked them that question yet. And if they say, no, John, we'd rather not, I can't hit the record button. Okay. Okay, I'll put in that other one in the other Zoom link for the PWC one. Question? just had a quick question. I tried during the break to sign up for that uh, path to CPA. There is not a Zoom link. Is that going to be distributed later? Yeah. Once you read the, that one, they're doing a little differently. Um, kind of when I go more formally through the university, because, um, you know, they wanted, they didn't want it to be just limited to my CPA class. They thought this would also be helpful for accounting 302, which is the ethics class. And so when I go through the university, they're a little more formal. You have to sign up and then if you're red, you have to register. And then if you're registered, they send you the link. Got it, thank you. But in all honesty, it's probably gonna be the same link as that, as these. <laughs> but uh, but um, yeah, but just go ahead and go through their process. Okay, great. I, know, I, may, I may do a different link. I'm not, I haven't decided yet, but anyway. It'll be my my Zoom link, one of the ones I probably use frequently. So so very likely the same one we're using for this class, right? No, probably not. No, um, it'll be the same. Well, not the one we're using for this class, but this one right here that we're using. Oh, the one for the speakers. Got it. Thank you. I think it'll probably be that same one. Yeah. If I was a gambling person, that's what I should bet on, huh? <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean... Although getting into Zoom and setting up meetings is very exciting, uh, I don't want to be sitting here having to set up a new Zoom link every time I set up a, you know, a new speaker. The only reason PwC would be different is, you know, in the spirit of full disclosure, guys, I'm doing these at different schools. Are really the the school that I attracted them to was not necessarily Golden Gate. Uh, and that's not a disparage on Golden Gate because sometimes I do it the other way. I have someone come and speak to Golden Gate and I invite the other schools. Um, so the 15th, the 22nd, the 29th and the 5th, that's really as far as the speakers are concerned, they're coming to San Francisco State. Uh, for the 8-9 speech, um, oops, sorry, the dog's trying to get up on his bench and I want him to fall down. Uh, on his chair, my shadow he never leaves me. <laughs> it's, it's a, I'm watching my friend's dog, and the dog never takes his eyes off of me for some reason. But um, the um, uh, Monday eight nine speech at Stanford, and so I'm going to link it to that class's uh, Zoom link, you know, just to make it a little easier. So, but then again, it may be the same one. We'll see. Sorry, guys. Okay. I'm kind of thinking out Thank loud. You. Yeah. So let's just go ahead and uh, let's take a look at the um, chat started chapter two here. Sorry. And um, let's put it in full screen. Okay. And it says financial management. So, really, guys, to a certain extent, we're going to be doing a review of your finance class. Okay. And we're going to tonight start talking about capital structure. That's probably about five points on the exam. We'll talk about working capital management. That's probably about two to three points. Okay. What's interesting here is when they start talking about some of these, I feel a, uh, written communication simulation coming in some of these. And so I'll point some of that out as we go through that tonight. 
Uh, we probably won't get to it this time, um, but we'll talk about financial valuation methods next time. That's about five points. And then financial decision models, that's gonna also be about five points, okay? So they're basically making you show that you have a business degree here, okay? And so you probably had a finance class now at some point, and so we'll start to review some of those things that you uh, would have seen in your finance class. Okay, so let's just start to take a look at the capital structure components, guys. And I'm not gonna talk about this. If you want to look at the uh, video recording for it, that's fine. I don't wanna sit here and use our time together to read through to you, you know, what the different types of bonds are, um, you know, how a lease works, that sort of thing. Um, these are all financing vehicles that um, I don't see any point in us sitting here and reading a bunch of definitions together, okay? So if you wanna look at that video, the Becker pre-recorded video, you can, or you could just work the uh, questions for module one and learn from the questions, okay? What I wanna get into more is where we're actually doing some analysis as opposed to sitting here and just reading off a bunch of definitions, okay? So let's just look at the weighted average cost of capital, okay? And what we're going to see <coughs> is that there are different sources of capital that a company can use for different projects that they're involved in. They wanna build a building and they want to secure the financing for that. So they could use um, their issuance of preferred stock. They could use a situation where they issue some debt. And then when they talk about, and you're saying, well, how about common stock? Well, the way they consider the cost of common stock is, well, what will it cost us to use our retained earnings as part of that financing uh, of a particular project. And you could use a combination of those. And so when we're talking about weighted average cost of capital now, we're talking about, well, what is the weighted average if you used, you know, one of those, the weighted average would be whatever the cost of that one is, say the debt. If you were using a combination, it could be all three. It could be the, the uh, cost of, the debt, the cost of the preferred stock, and the cost of retained earnings, okay? So we're going to see that the average cost of capital serves as a major link between the long-term investment decisions associated with the corporation's capital structure and the wealth of the corporate owners, okay? The weighted average cost of capital is often used as a hurdle rate for decisions, okay? And so just let's look at the pass key and the mixture of debt and equity financing that provides the lowest weighted average cost of capital maximizes the wealth of the firm. And why don't you just go ahead and flashcard that, okay? Now you come over and they do give us a formula here. And I am going to ask you guys to flashcard this formula, okay? You gotta have this formula in your head when you walk into the exam. I typically am a little bit nervous about asking you to memorize formula, but in this case, we got to do it, okay? Now, the good news is, is that after you've messed with this a couple times, it's pretty easy to remember what you're supposed to do, and you've got that formula in your head, okay? So let's just look at the different elements here, okay? Let's start off by looking at the elements that constitute that formula. And V is the sub market value of the individual components of the firm's capital. Okay. And that could be common stock equity, E, preferred stock equity, P, and D. Okay. And the V is going to be the sum of each one of those. So you take the E plus the D plus the P, not necessarily in the order they're showing us here that would be the V, the denominator. So they're what percentage is equity, what percentage is um, preferred stock, what percentage is debt, okay? Then we have the required rate of return, okay, on each one of those. So notice there's an RE, there's an RP, and then there's also an RD. But notice that they tell us 
that we have to take the after tax effect of that. Why? Because interest is deductible for tax purposes. So you have to consider that net of tax. So the T is what only applicable to the debt portion. Portion. Okay. All right. Now you want to flashcard that formula, but let's just go ahead and look at this and um, maybe um, I'm a little bit weird. Well, I know I'm weird um, because I kind of find these kind of this, these kind of fun sometimes when you look at these and just trying to figure out what are the things I have to pull out of the problem to be able to uh, get to the right answer. And it's kind of like the better you get at it, the more fun you have. And how do you get better at it? You got to practice with these, right? Okay, so let's just go ahead and let's take a look at this. And we say, assume the cost of common equity. Let me go ahead and highlight as we go along. Common equity for XYZ is 8.4%. Okay, great. We got that 8.4%. That's the cost of the common stock. The cost of preferred stock equity is 6.8%. And the weighted interest rate on the company's debt is 6%. Assume that the market value percentage of each component capital structure are 55% common stock, 20% preferred stock, and 25% debt. And then they give us the corporate tax rate. We know we're going to have to apply that to our, um, uh, basically to our uh, debt only, right? Now you go ahead and to get the weighted average cost of capital, right? We pick up for each one of these, okay? They give us the 8.4 and they told us 8.4 is for the preferred stock. And they told us that, um, it's 55%, um, what am I doing here? 55% um, common stock. So they give me that 55%, 20% preferred stock. Okay, so preferred stock is 6.8, there it is. Common stock, I was getting nervous there for a minute. Common stock is 8.4, there it is, 55% for that. 20% for the preferred stock, 6.8%. And then the um, debt is considered 25%, but notice we have to take what? The one minus the 30 or 0.7 times the 6% on the debt because we need to consider that after tax because the interest is tax deductible. That's where they got that 4.2. And you do the math on that and you get the 7.03. Okay. Okay, good. Now let's take a look at how we will come up with these um, rates because they kind of just gave them here to us. But let's see how they come up with these rates for uh, each of the individual um, capital components. Now we consider the long term. We don't consider the short term. Okay, so we're not worried about notes payable and accounts payable, etc. Although be careful if you see something that gives an interest rate, then you probably want to consider that. But in terms of accounts payable and items that don't carry interest, you don't really have to uh, worry about the considering the um, cost of capital and short term items. Okay, but be careful. If you see something that calls out an interest rate, then you're probably going to want to use it. Okay. Now you take a look at the um, debt first. Okay. And when we figure the weighted average cost of the debt. Okay. First, we need to have to come up with a weighted average interest rate. And I'm going to ask you to flashcard that which is the effective annual interest payments divided by the uh, debt outstanding. Okay, that gives us the weighted average interest rate. And then as we already talked about, we have to consider that after tax. Okay, so once you get that interest rate, you're gonna have to multiply it by one minus the tax rate, because again, 
you basically save tax by having an expense an interest expense. Okay. All right, I'm not going to read that after tax costs. I think we get the point here that we have to uh, multiply it by one minus the tax rate when we redo that question. Okay. Uh, by the way, guys, we're going to have a lot of flashcards in this chapter here at the beginning. And so um, when I indicate a flashcard for a formula, the first thing you should be doing is looking at the Becker flashcard to see if they already got it for you then you don't have to write it. If they don't have it for you, then you're gonna to have to create that card yourself. But I do absolutely want you to flashcard these formula, okay? Okay, good, cost of preferred stocks, okay? And um, you don't fall into the trap of applying a after-tax, you know, one minus the tax rate and after-tax calculation for dividends, because dividends, of course, as you well know, are not tax deductible, right? Okay, so let's just go ahead and flashcard. The cost of preferred stock is whatever the preferred stock dividend is divided by the net proceeds for preferred stock. Now, let's see what uh, they tell us about the dividend. Let's see what they tell us about the um, net proceeds for preferred stock, okay? And you want a flashcard as part of the flashcard, not only what you're supposed to divide one by, but also, you know, what, what the formula is, but also make sure you're clear on the elements of the formula. So let's just take a look. Preferred stock dividends could be stated as a dollar amount or a percentage. For example, 5% stock dividend pays an annual dividend of 5% of par value if dividends are declared by the corporation, okay? The net proceeds from preferred stock issues can be calculated as the proceeds net of flotation costs. Flotation costs, meaning if you have to pay an underwriter or a broker some amount to get that preferred stock to market, that would be subtracted off of the par value of the stock to get the net proceeds, okay? All right, so let's just look at this, guys. And again, I think, you know, once you get these things down, you're actually going to probably, maybe I'm talking crazy, but I think you actually might enjoy uh, some of these problems, okay? But let's take a look. Assume the preferred stock component of the weighted average cost of capital of a firm is 10%, $100 par value, and uh, there were flotation costs of uh, $5. So what happens? Well, the dividend per share is $10. The net proceeds per share is the 100 minus the five. There's your cost of the preferred stock. Okay, so yes, it's annoying to have to memorize these formulas, but it's not like you're having to then, you know, use the formula and um, do something stupid. Like when you take the, um, what do they call it? Chartered Financial Analyst exam, the CFA exam. You know, then they have you doing stupid things like taking reciprocals and everything else on this. Uh, I taught the financial accounting part of the CFA exam, which is part of part one of the CFA exam. CFA exam is a three part exam and I got roped in, I mean, talked into teaching the financial accounting part of the CFA and some of the things they make those guys do manipulate with some of these formulas, ridiculous. And I told uh, Becker, because they wanted me to teach that part of the CFA exam. And I told them, I'm not doing this anymore because when you have financial types in the class, I said, well, cash increase, so we debit it. Excuse me, sir, if cash increase, why would we debit it? Okay, I can't talk to you. Okay, so anyway, I don't teach that anymore. But, you know, it's annoying to have to know these formula like this. But I think the calculations that they have you do with them then are pretty straightforward. So uh, don't worry too, too much about all these formula. Just, um, you know, have them as flashcards, apply them. I think you'll find that it's actually kind of fun to do some of these. Okay, okay, good. Now, when we look at the cost of retained earnings, Okay, and cost of retained earnings is really how we're going to calculate that common stock portion 
of the cost, the cost of equity attained through retained earnings is how we're going to get the required return for our common shareholders, which is that common stock portion of the cost of capital for the weighted average cost of capital. So uh, three common methods, okay? Um, capital asset pricing model, which is my personal favorite, okay? Discounted cash flow and then bond yield plus um, premium and plus risk premium. And why don't you go ahead and flashcard those three? I could see somebody asking you an essay question. What are the three types of uh, methods for computing the cost to retain earnings? Okay. Now we're going to start with this capital asset pricing model. I like this. I don't know why. I just think it's kind of fun to use here. Okay. And so let's just take a look at the key assumptions. Cost of retain earning is equal to the risk-free rate of return plus a risk premium, okay? The market risk premium is equal to a systematic non-diversible risk associated with the overall stock market. And then the beta coefficient is a numerical representation of the volatility of risk of the overall market. So it's really beta coefficient. It's really talking about the correlation in terms of how this stock price moves versus the rest of the market, okay? So a beta equal to one means the stock is volatile as the market. A beta greater than one means the stock moves less volatility than the market. And a beta, beta, um, greater than one, where's my greater than one? Let me try this again. Beta equal to one means the market is, the, the stock is as volatile as the market. Let's try this one. A beta, a beta greater or less than one means that the stock is more if it's greater. No one's going to get a Pulitzer Prize for the way they wrote this. Um, a beta greater um, than one means that the stock is more volatile. And a beta, you guys are probably like, yeah, John, we got it. Less than one means that the stock is less volatile than the market. Okay. All right, good. And then the risk premium um, is the stock's beta coefficient multiplied by the market risk premium. Again, you can't diversify out of that. You say, well, what about the systematic risk, John? Well, the assumption there is that somebody can diversify out of that and wouldn't necessarily expect a return associated with that, right? And so then the market risk premium is the market rate of return minus the risk free, okay? So you come over and um, let's take a look and we have the uh, formula right here, okay? It's just flashcard this part of the formula. You don't need to do all that, uh, all those other steps. Just remember that part and you'll remember how to handle that when you apply it to a problem like this, okay? So let's take a look. Assume the market's beta is 1.25. So that means that this what? This stock is more volatile than the market, right? Risk-free rate of return is 8.75 and the market rate of return is 4.25. So we know we're at least gonna have to pay the risk-free. I mean, the only one that can borrow at the risk-free is the federal government, right? Plus, and then we take the beta and we apply that just to the portion of the um, risk that is, a, that is attributable um, to the, the uh, above the risk-free. Uh, rate. So we take the market minus the risk free. So now we've just got that portion that is not the risk free because we want to go ahead and then what? Amplify that, affect that by whatever the company's beta is. Okay. And when you do all that, you get this for 15.63 using the cap. <laughs>
capital asset price. <laughs> He should stop that, I think. Okay, he's a pretty good dog. He doesn't bark too much, but he decides to bark when I'm on the class. Okay, all right, question? Okay, good, let's go ahead and let's take a look at the discounted cash flow model. Okay, right here. And um, let's look at the key assumptions for this one now. And stocks are normal and equilibrium relative to risk and return. Okay, sorry guys. Is that bothering you tremendously? Can you hear me okay? Next to me. Uh, I'm sorry. Let me see if okay. I can get you to be quiet. One second. It's okay. Okay. Come on. Sit down. Okay. I think he's okay now. Okay. Um, Stocks are normally in equilibrium, okay? The estimated expected rate of return will yield an estimated required rate of return, and the expected growth rate may be based on projections of past growth rates and retention growth rate or analysis forecast. And, you know, you look at all that, and let's just flashcard this formula, okay? So the cost of retained earnings using the discounted cash flow model, and make sure you label it as such because they didn't really say that, that was the model here where p naught is the current market value or price of the outstanding common stock dividend per share at the end of one year and then you basically go ahead and um, have this constant growth rate that you apply now the one trick here is they give you the dividend but to turn it into the D1, so they'll tell you the D0, essentially, and to turn it into the D1, you're going to have to apply the growth rate. And you'll see how that works here in this example question. So they say, assume that the firm is a constant growth firm that just paid an annual common stock dividend of $2 and has a dividend growth rate of 7.5% and a current market price for the stock is 25.25 per share. And they want us to use the discounted cash flow method, compute the dividend per share as follows. And as I was saying, that's sort of the trick. Uh, we didn't mention D naught in the formula, but to turn into D1, you have to take whatever the current dividend that's given in the problem and then um, you know, grow it by the growth rate. So they're saying that by the end of the year, the dividend is going to be 2.15. And then you go ahead and now you've got the D1. You can take the D1 and divide that by the uh, stock, um, by the uh, stock, the uh, market price per share for the common stock and then you just go ahead and add that uh, dividend growth rate on to that and that gives you the cost of uh, the retained earnings using the discounted cash flow model okay okay good and then we get to the bond yield plus premium and uh, let's just look at that bond yield plus premium on the next page. And uh, let's flashcard that. And here it's just going to be the pre-tax cost of long-term debt plus a market um, risk premium. And guys, it's almost not worth looking at that question, but let's do it. They just take the two numbers that are given in that problem, which is the two numbers that are part of the formula, and they add them together, and that is your bond yield plus risk premium, okay? I think, you know, 
from a CPA exam standpoint, you're probably more likely to see the cap M as those, but uh, all of these are, you know, again, not terribly complicated ways that you have to manipulate the numbers to come up with the answers on questions. Okay, and then you could come up with a cost of retained earnings by taking all three methods, and you see the numbers that we got from the previous examples, dividing that by three. Why by three? Because there's three numbers in the numerator to get the average cost of your retained earnings. Okay, all right, good. Not too bad. Let's take a look at a couple multiple choice questions. I'm giving you a little more time with this one. Um, so you got about 30 seconds left, okay? Try to wrap it up. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, take a look at this one. And um, we're not quite getting the results I would have expected here. Most of us picked A 
for some reason I have B selected here. So unless I mess this up when I uh, looked at the solutions, I think B is correct, but I didn't write down my final answer after I um, did my calculations. So maybe I, um, maybe we'll learn something here, but let's just go ahead and let's take a look at this one, okay? All right, now, the way I set these up is I look at this and I see that they give me some information, 15 million, 20 year bonds, 101, flotation costs, use 35 million of funds generated from retained earnings. Okay, well, that's useful. So it's gonna be 35 million of funds from retained earnings and 15 million of funds from bonds. So at that point, I already know that my what for my retained earnings portion it's going to be 35 divided by 50 and for my uh, debt portion right it's going to be 15 divided by 50. okay so i know i've got that part of my cap in um that I'm going to use to determine the, I'm not the cap in, but I'm going to use to determine the weighted average cost of capital. But now I've got to get the returns on these. Okay. So I start looking at this and they tell me right out that the average cost of debt is 7%. So I don't have to do any after tax calculations. I know that I'll be able to just multiply that 15 20th by the, uh, I mean, 50th, I should say, by the 0.07. But now I've got to get what the cost of the funds generated from retained earnings. And even though they don't call out the cap end model, they are giving me all the tools that I need to use the cap M. So I know that the cap M is going to be what? The risk free. And notice they use treasury bonds. It could be the 10 year note, whatever but they're using bonds here. So I'm gonna pick up that 0 0.05, but then I have to uh, address that for the company's um, amount of risk that is over the market rate of risk. So now they tell me that the company's um, beta coefficient is estimated to be 0.6. So I know I'm going to multiply 0.6 times what? times the market risk, which is, where's my market risk? Uh, I know it's 12%, but where is it? Here it is. Um, the cost of equity is 12%, right? But I need to do what? I need to subtract off of that the risk-free. So I have to subtract and I'll just do it 0.12 minus the 0 0.05, which is the risk-free. And then I multiply that times the, um, the uh, beta. Now, when I do that, I get, um, when you do the work inside the parentheses, and I'm kind of going slow here because I don't know why everyone got a different answer than mine, 0 0.05 and then you're going to do 0.6 times, do the work inside the parentheses, 0.6 times what? That's a point. Six times 0 0.07, right? So, I mean, not point, not 0 0.07, but 0 0.7. Um, percent. 7% essentially. Okay, so then when I multiply 0 0.6 times 0 0.7, I get 0 0.05 plus uh, 4.2%. So 5% plus 4.2% should give me what? 9.2%. And so when I apply that 9.2%, 
to the 35 50ths, right? And I go ahead and I do the math on all that. I got, did you get something different? I think what's confusing is the way the question's written because it says assume the after tax cost of debt is 7%, cost of equity is 12%, determine the weighted average cost of capital. That sounds pretty straightforward. I don't know what the rest of the stuff and the problem's all about. And I didn't I, I thought it was kind of a trap, actually. <laughs> okay, you know what? You might be right though. I I, I might not be right. <laughs> I may <laughs> could be sadly deluded. <laughs> I mean, I've seen capital. Yeah, you might be right. I think that was the problem that I had with this question too. Did anybody look it up in the software yet? Let's look it up in the software because I might have gone my my fetish with the cap M model. But you can also use cap M with a weighted average cost of capital. Uh, but then they went ahead. I went through me or why I picked and a half percent because I obviously did that um, is is what they is because they tell you the cost of equity and maybe maybe I was you know I was taking the easy way out <laughs> you might be right though let me see let's let's look at this because I remember now I had a problem with this question but I'm not sure I ever fully resolved. So let's just do this real quick. And I apologize, guys. I don't mean you usually use the cap M to determine the cost of equity, but then they tell you what it is. So that was what I why I thought that maybe they were trying to figure out if you knew the difference. Yeah, but let's see. So I want to find question. What is it? MCQ 3385. I seem to remember what I did wrong with this question. Yeah, see, I got it wrong and I forgot to fix that in, in my notes. And so, Kathy, you're right. They just used a 12%. So I think most of you got it right. But what I can't explain to you is why wouldn't this is this question is evil because don't give me all the pieces of another way to calculate the cost of capital, expecting me to know to ignore all that to just use the number you gave me. I, I can't explain why they did this this way. The examiners, this looks like a typical exam question. Because when I use the cap M, I get a different answer. It's well, I have seen the weighted average cost of capital used with um, with cap M because you would use the cap M. I mean, we do we do this all the time where I work. You use the cap M to derive the cost of equity, but here they tell you that. Um, and I think because they tell you that and they say assume, that was what led me to mm -hmm. choose the easy way out. <laughs> rather than which is great to... yeah but I, I, the problem that i have is they really should not have given you all the elements to calculate the cost of the retained earnings using the cap m because they just led you down that path there to use that i just i don't understand why that question did that i still don't get it but you're right if you say they say assume to use a 12%, that's why they use a 12%. I don't know what to tell you guys. I don't care for this question, obviously, because I got it wrong. <laughs> okay. Question. It's not a great question. Okay, let's look at the next one. Let's move on from that because I can't explain to you. I really don't have an answer. And then, you know, Becker doesn't help much. They say per above. Well, but it, tell me why they didn't use all the way the average cost of capital information. Okay, let's go ahead and go back. It could 
something like kind of what you were saying when we were talking about interest rate, that if they tell you something is the state, if they ask you for the stated rate, don't give them the effective rate. You know, it could be, the question could be easier than it seems. So it seems like a testing strategy issue. Yeah, it is. But I guess what I don't understand is why couldn't you do it the other way? I don't see that there's any theoretical problem with doing it the other way and getting a different answer, you know? So anyway, okay. So they really, they shouldn't have an, now, now if they gave me, if they didn't give me an answer that didn't involve using the cap in, so the answer ended up being 10.5%, which I think most of you got it right. So you guys are smarter than me. If, you know, they didn't give me an answer that involved using the cap in, then I'd say, okay, yeah, I, I see that they had a default to what they gave you, but they gave me all the elements to use the cap M. So, okay, enough. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at, and I remember I've asked that question and I can't seem to get a good answer as to why they did that. Okay, let's take a look at this one. Let me put the poll up. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at this one. I'm giving you a little more time with these because there's uh, you know different layers of calculation, but uh, good. That's a good uh, outcome for a question that's a little bit you know involved. Maybe you had to look back at the cap in, but you can see 
uh, why I'm asking you to uh, memorize that, but the correct answer is D, okay? But let's just practice one more time with that. So they tell me risk-free is what? 6%, so I know I've got to pick that up, okay? And then I'm going to have to add in the um, risk premium using the beta coefficient, which is 1.25 for this company. And then I'm going to have to apply that to just the portion of uh, market risk that's over the risk free. And so I take the market rate minus the um, risk free rate, right? Because I need to apply that beta coefficient to that portion. And that's how you end up getting the 16%. Okay. So again, it's annoying that you have to memorize a formula, but it's not the world's you know, most uh, difficult formula. And I'm going to send Becker an email about question one um, in that sequence because I still don't understand why if the equity market is expected to earn 12%, why we would then just use 12% and ignore the firm's beta associated with that. But anyway, maybe I should just let it go. What do you think? Let it go or send them an email? I'll say send them an email. That's email. weird. You should have at least came with the same answer in both methods. Or, or if they had one of the choices, because I think when I did, maybe that was the problem. Did anyone run my numbers and see if you got um, 8.5? I don't know. I don't know what if you did. What a great example to put in a training book because you're just getting used to the concepts and you'd probably want a simpler question to be used as an example here. Yeah. I think what they're trying to do there though is kind of teach you to kind of what you observed it and said assume use that so use it you know but I just want to have a more of a theoretical discussion with them about it so I'll see what I find out there okay good let's move on guys I have trouble letting things go so let's just move on um okay optimal capital structure is the one with the lowest weighted average cost of capital just flashcard that no one is going to be asking you to take a derivative of the formula to come up with the you know minimum cost of capital so uh, don't worry about having to do that just know that the optimal capital structure is one with the lowest weighted average cost of capital okay all right good um come over and let's flashcard something about loan covenants down here and you can sit there all day and say, well, the best way for me to structure this is to take on more debt. But if you have a what? If you have a loan covenant that the uh, your lenders are going to say, well, we're not going to let your debt to equity ratio get out of whack to where now, you know, we're being exposed because you're taking on too much debt then that's gonna stop you in your tracks from coming up with an ultimate capital structure that's gonna lower to minimize your weighted average cost of capital because you've got contracts, you've got loan covenants that aren't gonna allow you to do that. Okay, so you need to flashcard that. And if they say the loan covenant will not allow any more debt, then debt is not gonna be part of that uh, calculation. Okay, all right, good. Let's take a look at profitability, okay, and growth. Uh, and growth and profitability. And let's just first take a look at growth rate. Okay. And our growth rate, you can flashcard this, it's pretty straightforward, but we're going to get into flashcard mode here quite a bit. That is the return on assets times retention. How long are you going to hold those, app, uh, those assets? And then one minus the return on assets time retention. That's going to be your growth rate. And then you can go ahead and flashcard that and you can see how that's applied to this question here and that we have a um, retention rate of 60%. Okay, and we have the growth rate is 7.5 and then you simply apply those to the formula that's your growth rate 4.7% in this example. Okay. 
Okay, good. Come over and let's take a look at profitability. And a key financial measure of success for companies, profitability. It's included, uh, include return on sales and return on investment and return on assets. Okay. And um, so all else being equal, higher profitability ratio means that an entity is um, more desirable versus its peers. So notice here, guys, that we have to take income before interest, expense, and taxes. In other words, and you may see some questions that might call that out as a um, for a return on sales part of the profitability uh, formula. Um, it may um, basically be operating income. So if they give you operating income, then you can use that net sales. Okay, that's sales minus returns and allowances and discounts, right? And then return on investment is going to be your net income divided by your average invested capital. Average invested, average, typically it's what? The beginning plus the end divided by two, okay? And sometimes students say, well, why is the average divided by two beginning and divided by two? Because it's two numbers in the numerator. And if I want the average, they basically sit there and just take the beginning balance, the ending balance divided by two. Look, you wouldn't build a bridge with this kind of a calculation, right? When's the wind blowing? You measure December 31st, January 1st, divide by two, the bridge is gonna fall down. When we're making these kind of you know, calculations, nobody's gonna die if we don't get it perfect. So uh, they just go ahead and sort of you know, hash it in there. The beginning plus the ending, average invested capital divided by uh, beginning plus the ending, invested capital divide that by two. Okay, same thing here for return on assets and then return on equity, flashcard, all of these. Again, if you have the flashcard already, then uh, that Becker's already given you, then you don't, what you paid for already, then you don't have to uh, sit there and recalculate that. I have a question. Um, sure. Invested capital, yeah. when they say invested capital, are they talking about debt plus equity, which is a, kind of a valuation world uh, definition of invested capital? I think they're going to be telling you investing what the invested capital is. So it'll be a given in the problem or something. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't have to sit there. Now they may give you again, the, they may not call out the average. They may give you the beginning and the ending and they'll call it out as invested capital, but they're not going to get, you know, too, too uh, deep on how they're making you calculate that beyond that. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, so those three formulas. Okay, good. Leverage uh, and risk. Okay, and we're going to talk about two types of leverage here, operating leverage, and then we're going to talk about financial leverage on the next page. Okay, now the way to think about leverage is this, operating leverage. The higher your fixed costs, okay, the greater your operating leverage. Okay, so your fixed costs are up, your operating leverage is up. If your fixed costs are what? Down, meaning you have more variable cost then your operating leverage is going to be down. So what they're saying here is this, you have a set of fixed costs and you have that sort of risk exposure there that if you don't generate enough contribution margin to cover your fixed cost, you're gonna be in a loss situation. But once your contribution margin, which is your sales minus your variable cost, once you're, uh, once you your contribution margin covers your fixed cost, then what? Then you start to be highly profitable at a very quick rate. That is what they're talking about with operating leverage. So 
the entity that has what a nicer contribution margin has more uh, leverage essentially, okay? So let's just look though and see what they tell us here in terms of definition, okay? Operating leverage is the degree to which a company uses fixed operating costs rather than variable costs, higher contribution margin, and we're going to be kind of risky there. And then once we get over that hurdle of break even, we're going to uh, see a higher level of profitability. So capital intensive industries often have high operating leverage. Labor intensive industries generally they have low operating leverage. In other words, what? If you're a capital intensive, you probably have more fixed cost. If you're a labor intensive, you probably have more variable cost because labor uh, tends to be a variable cost, right? Now, let's take a look at the implications. A company with a high operating leverage must produce sufficient sales to cover its high fixed cost. High operating leverage which is beneficial when sales revenue is high, contribution margin is high, right? Sales revenue is high, contribution margin, more quickly going to cover fixed costs, more quickly in contribution margin contributes first to fixed cost and then profitability, right? Now, a company with a high operating leverage will have greater risk, but also greater returns. There's risk because the variability of profit is greater with higher operating leverage. In other words, you can be in a loss situation down here. And if you're not generating enough sales, loss, no income. And then once you get over that hurdle, at first it's pretty slow in terms of your profitability, and then it's going to go up as the more uh, your sales go up, although it'll probably be linear. But um, let's go ahead and just flashcard that. Note, when sales decline, a company with a high operating leverage may struggle to cover its fixed cost. However, beyond the break-even point, they will retain a higher percentage of additional revenues and operating income. So flashcard that one, and you don't have to flashcard these two because that summarizes it right there. Okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look. I don't think we need that example. Let's just not look at that example because that's kind of self-explanatory from the outline. Now let's look at financial leverage. Okay. And with financial leverage, now we're going to see that the more fixed interest we have, then the higher our financial uh, leverage. So financial leverage is a degree which a company uses debt rather than act equity to finance the company. So a company that issues debt must produce significant operating income to cover its fixed interest costs. However, once fixed interest costs are covered, additional earning before income and taxes will go straight to net income and earning per share. So let's take a look. A higher degree of financial leverage implies a relatively small change in earnings before interest and taxes will have a greater effect on the profits of the shareholders. Okay. And of course, the fact that interest is tax deductible um, makes that after tax effect of the interest, um, you know, less. So we can flashcard that point there. And then coming down, companies that are highly leveraged may uh, be at risk of bankruptcy if they are unable to make the payments of their debt. Okay, And this also kind of ignores the notion that there are variable interest rate um, type of, you know, um, loans that an entity could be involved in. And so you really need to be looking more at the fixed debt to consider the financial leverage, the fixed interest. Okay, again, I don't think we need to get into these sort of examples that are, you know, not really showing any calculation, but just uh, sort of reinforcing the theory. Okay, okay, good. Let's take a look at the value of a leverage firm and let's go ahead and take a look. A leverage firm is a company that has debt in its capital structure. Whereas an unleveraged firm only has equity and no debt. Okay, now I think that's worth flashcarding because I think we're used to saying, well, a company is leveraged and we tend to mean that they are what, highly leveraged. Leverage means you have 
any kind of debt in your capital structure. Unleveraged means you have no debt in your capital structure. So uh, I think it's worth flashcarding that in case somebody tried to trick us up on that. Now, let's flashcard the value of the leveraged firm. So the value of the unleveraged firm is the value of the unleveraged firm plus the present value of interest tax savings. Okay, so you can see that formula here, which is going to be the um, this part of the formula present value. Okay, this part right here, okay, is going to be the corporate tax rate times the interest rate on the uh, debt times obviously the amount of debt and then that's divided by the interest rate on the debt that gives you then the present value of the tax savings. So you take a look and um, let's look at this example on the next page where they go ahead and show us that. And we have the value of the company with no debt in its capital structure is 130. Thank you very much. The company has issually, recently issued 25 million of debt and has an interest rate of 5.75% using the formula, we get 137.5. Okay. Okay, good. Now, um, we start to take a look guys and they give us some formula here that I'm just gonna tell you quickly to flashcard these, okay? And you probably already have the flashcards, but there's no explanation necessary. Total debt ratio is your total liabilities divided by your assets, okay? Debt to equity ratio is your liabilities divided by your equity. And this is the, um, formula that might um, be used, or this one might be used. Remember when we talked about the debt covenants and they might say that they don't want these to fall within certain amounts. And if they do, they're gonna call the debt. So that could right there tell a company, well, we can't issue any more debt because of these loan covenants we have. Okay, come over. Let's take a look at equity multiplier, flashcard that total assets divided by total equity, okay? Coming down times interest earned. I think that you have uh, probably dealt with this before, earnings before interest and taxes. Again, sometimes they'll call that out as their operating income and then divide that by the interest expense. That will give you the, um, um, the times interest earned, okay? Nothing earth shattering there. Let's just go ahead and take a look at this question.
Okay, guys, um, let's go ahead and take a look at this one. And um, most of us got it right, but we're kind of all over the place on this one. Um, so let me ask you this. We said that definition of financial leverage means that what? you have a fair amount of fixed interest that you're paying. And once you kind of get over that fixed interest, then you're going to see higher profitability because what? Because the interest is tax deductible. So your after tax interest rate is you know less than whatever the stated interest is on the you know, debt instruments, say bonds, I guess, in this case. Um, so if that's the case, then what taking on more debt could give you better financial leverage, right? Are we all in agreement on that? Yes. Okay. So if we kind of see that, that taking on more debt gives you more financial leverage, then we start looking and, you know, you may say, oh, well, yeah, better financial leverage is a good thing. Well, there's also more risk with that, right? So no one's sitting here saying, hey, you're not going to be financially leveraged. We just need to understand the definition. So kind of get your mind out of the qualitative analysis of it and more of the, what, the definitional analysis of it. So they give you all these numbers. And you start thinking, well, gee, they must want me to do something with these. And really, all they're asking you is, do you know the definition, definition of financial leverage? So let's take a look. I tell you, he doesn't bark all day. He's choosing this moment to give me a hard time barking. Okay. So what happens? We sit here, financial leverage would increase as a result of issuing common stock and using the proceeds to retire preferred stock. That's not going to affect our financial leverage at all. It's all equity. Issuing common stock and using the proceeds to retire bonds. Well, if that's the case, then what? We're actually reducing our financial leverage because we're replacing debt with equity. Financing its future investments with higher percentage of bonds. Now we're what? Taking on more debt here, aren't we? Financing future investments with a higher percentage of equity. That's going to be the opposite of... Uh, trying to take a leveraged approach. Okay. So this question was more definitional. This was a distractor, guys. And uh, that's why it's always important to make sure that you kind of understand what the question is trying to do to you as you go and look at it. Okay. Okay, good. Let's take a look at working capital. Okay, maybe he's mad because I'm not paying enough attention to him because he gets pampered all day while I'm working. And then when I'm not paying attention to him, he starts wanting to attract his attention. Let's look at working capital. Okay, now working capital by definition is going to be my current assets minus current liabilities, right? That's going to be my working capital. Okay, so they tell us it's the difference between my current assets, current liability, okay? Now, um, we take a look and we can turn that into a ratio, okay? And flashcard that ratio, it's probably the easiest ratio in the whole book, current assets divided by current liabilities, okay? Now, we want this number to be less than one or greater than one? Greater. Yeah. yeah. We want this number to be greater than one. And by the way, um, um, greater than um, one. And we want this number to be positive. <laughs> okay. But we're going to see that there are some implications if the number is too much greater than one, or if that number is too positive relative to some other measures, because it could indicate that the company's got their current assets tied up and they could be using them to get some sort of better return for the uh, stockholders. So we'll consider that as well, okay? Now, if we want an even more critical measure of our solvent, of our, um, our ability to meet our current liabilities, we could use 
something called quick ratio, okay? So just go ahead and flashcard this, but notice that we leave out certain current assets. So there's no, uh, no um, prepaids. What else is missing here? Inventory. No inventory, good, okay? And they're basically saying, hey, look, if you need cash, okay, you're gonna have to wait till you can sell your inventory to get cash. Um, so that may not be the best measure of how your ability to meet your current obligations and prepaids, go ahead, go to you know the grocery store sometime and try to sell your prepaid insurance. They're not gonna have to take that there and say, you got any money, okay? So things that get a little bit harder to convert into cash, which prepaid, you're never gonna be able to convert it into cash in most cases, then um, you know that's gonna give you your quick ratio, okay? Okay, good. So it's a more rigorous test of liquidity. Okay, all right, good. Question, did I hear a question trying to come in? Okay, okay good. Now, cash conversion cycle, okay? And what the cash conversion cycle says, is you've got cash sitting inside your inventory. All you gotta do is sell it. You've got cash sitting in your accounts receivable. All you have to do is collect it. And you've got what? A potential cash, putting dollar signs here because they're looking, this is cash, but this for the payables, outstanding payables is what is essentially uh, cash outflow. So if you know how long your cash sits in your inventory before it's cash, how long your cash sits in receivable before you collect that cash, and how long your takes you to let the cash go that is sitting in your payables, that will give us in days a cash conversion cycle. Flashcard that. Okay. Okay, good. Now uh, we're going to see that we're going to need to be able to calculate each one of these elements, though, using these uh, formula down here. Okay, so days in inventory. And you first have to calculate your inventory turnover. So flashcard that. And that's cost of goods sold divided by average inventory. I'm not going to keep doing this, guys, just one more time beginning inventory plus ending inventory divided by two, right, is average. So when they ask for the average, just remember to do that. And then once you know how many times you turn your inventory over, if you wanna get your days in inventory, take your, and guys, this could be average, okay? It doesn't have to be ending. So be careful, I've seen questions where you have to use the average um, if they give you the beginning and the ending, just assume that you should use the average. If they just give you the ending, then of course you can use the ending, but you take the ending and then you divide that by the number of times you turned your cost of goods sold um, over. That will give you the days in inventory. So flashcard that. Okay. Okay, good. So to get to the days in inventory, I don't know why they did the inventory turnover as part of that. You could get it right there. Okay, but go ahead and flashcard that inventory turnover as well. All right. Okay, good. Days in account receivable. Again, we're trying to get the elements that uh, the components, if you will, of that cash conversion cycle. So accounts receivable turnover is going to be your sales divided by your average account receivable net. When we say net account receivable, we mean what? The AR less what? The allowance. Reserve. Yeah. Less the allowance, right? Okay, so just remember that. That's how you come up with the uh, account receivable net. You divide that by the sale into the sales. I should say that gives you the accounts receivable turnover. Days in account receivable, the ending, and they keep using the ending here. So I don't know. It seems like you'd want to use the average, but if they want to use the ending and then you take your average sales per day, 
that gives you the days and accounts receivable. And again, they keep showing us two formula here. It's not that there's a problem understanding the accounts receivable turnover. It's just that uh, you could get to the days without calculating the uh, accounts receivable turnover. Okay. And then days of payable outstanding. And let's just go straight to the formula ending. So I guess they want us to use the ending. I've seen other discussions that talk about using the average, but um, let's just stick with what the book is saying and don't worry about the average, just use the ending. Forget what I said up there. Okay, and um, you could also do your accounts payable turnover, which is your cost of goods sold, the flashcard, both of these divided by your average accounts payable. Okay. All right, guys, I, you know, don't have a whole lot more to say other than get these formula down. And then once you did the days in accounts receivable, days in inventory, days payable, outstanding, and you add those together, that then would give you um, your cash conversion cycle. And I'm not going to go through that problem because it's just taking numbers and plugging them into those various formula we've been talking about. Okay. Okay, good. Um, now you come over and I think what's more useful to us right here are the analysis. Okay. And I'm going to ask you to flashcard each one of these and I'm going to talk through them with you, um, read through them with you, but put down here, good written communication. Topic. Okay, and I'm putting that there because it's not just a matter of having these formula. You gotta have the formula, absolutely. And that's why I'm telling you the flashcards so you know how to even calculate these, but then they will likely ask you to go another step forward and say, well, what does that mean? And they may ask you to provide that in the form of a written communication. Okay. So let's take a look here. And they talk about days in inventory and a company is doing well when it quickly converts inventory into sales. More days in inventory could mean the inventory becomes obsolete and ultimately sunk cost to the entity if they can't sell it. If the days in inventory is too short, the company may not have enough inventory on hand to support potential sales. So when you look at that, that really what talks about two different things that could be indicated by your days in inventory. So when you get a question like this, right, you're trying to maximize points. So I'm looking, they're asking me about these three things that we've been talking about, but how many items should I be commenting on here? I see the three, but do you see more points by realizing that you're actually commenting on what? You're actually commenting on six different things. Well, what would be good, but if it's too high, it could be a problem, right? So that's how you need to look at some of these written communication is look for the for and against, the what's bad, what's good. Okay, and when you do that, then you allow yourself opportunity to gather more points. And then, of course, you need to use good grammar. Okay, now you would use the phrase days in inventory, days in uh, accounts receivable, days of payable outstanding, cash, what cash conversion cycle could be indicated by that. And you get points by using proper grammar and using the terms that they give you in the problem. So even if you were like, you know, I can't remember anything about the days in inventory, so what? Just keep saying days in inventory could indicate that the company has their inventory for several days. Uh, having a high days in inventory means that they are holding their inventory for more days, et cetera. Okay, now you're not gonna get 100% for that, but the fact that you're being responsive and you're using good grammar will yield you quite a bit of the points. The other thing 
to always remember when you're in a written communication is there's one that is not graded. So you can't sit there and try to write the perfect answers that you see in the Becker software, you know, when you're writing these, because that's going to take too long. And if you spend too much time on one of those written communication and they don't grade it, you just hurt your chances of passing the BEC exam and you miss it by one point because you spent a bunch of time working on a <clears throat> written communication that wasn't graded. That's a disaster. We don't want that. Okay. Okay, good. So you'll see, guys, and I'm not going to read through all of these, a similar analysis here for these uh, three elements that constitute the cash conversion cycle. Most important thing, I want you to flashcard those type of analysis and make sure that you remember that you want to keep those in your back pocket figuratively. You don't bring them into the exam um, <clears throat> in, your, uh, in your head in your back pocket into your head it's back pocket um to um, potentially respond to written communication question um uh, are they always using 360 is this an example where they're using 365 for the number of days instead of 360 yeah that's a good question um Whereas the interest questions they usually use 360 is that a distinction yeah if it's a if it's an analysis then use the 365. If it's something that could potentially yield an accounting entry, then use 360. Okay. Does that answer? Yeah, I just, I'm, I'm having trouble figuring out why they'd be different, but that's all, why an accounting entry would be 360, but that's just the testing style, right? Well, not necessarily. It's more of a tradition in accounting to use a 360 day year because we do we do that all the time. For example, when we do a depreciation calculation, we divide it by the number of months, which assumes that all the months have equal days, which they don't. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So let's go ahead then. And let's take a look at a couple more formula here, guys. And I know this isn't exactly the most scintillating conversation you've ever had, okay? But it is what it is. We got to know these things. And working capital turnover is basically saying, hey, what is my sales divided by my average working capital? And again, beginning here, they finally told us for the average beginning working capital plus ending uh, working capital divided by two, okay? Now, what's the analysis? And I find this um, interesting, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and ask you to flashcard this because this again could be a written communication, okay? But let's take a look. A higher working capital turnover ratio implies that the company is doing a relatively good job of converting its working capital into sales. Too low implies too, many, too much money is invested in current assets, such as receivable and inventory, okay? Too high of a ratio, this is probably the more important part, implies that there may not be enough capital in place to continue to support operations and sales. So again, we tend to think that, you know, the higher these numbers are, the better, and I want you to really think through, well, what could be the implications of too high of a number, okay? Okay, good. Let's take a look at questions one and two here.
Okay, guys, let's look at this one. And um, I'm gonna end the poll. And um, this question, I'm a little surprised that we had so much variability in the answers, but most of us, 64% of us got it right. Okay, now look, you can't get this question right if you don't know what, how to calculate working capital. So the first thing in getting the right answer here is to know that working capital is current assets minus current liabilities, right? Okay. Now, let me ask you this. Um, if everything, if I have account, what are, what are examples of my current assets? Cash, accounts receivable, right? Huh? Inventory. Inventory. Fixed assets. Fixed assets are not current assets. Oh, oh no, sorry. Okay. All right. Don't make me don't 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 you dare mess up my music like that. <laughs> Sometimes I react in way certain ways. It's kind of like you ever seen a music teacher and he's teaching the kid the trumpet and the kid's destroying the trumpet and he's like losing his mind because the guy loves the instrument so much. <laughs> That's like a bad note. Well, fixed assets, no, are not current. Okay, so we have what? We have cash, accounts receivable, inventory. So if I use cash to pay off my account receivable, then what's happening? My current asset, I'm just replacing one for another. There's no change in my current in my working capital. Okay, so no, right? Cash payment of accounts payable. What happens here? Well, that means this one is what coming down, and this one is coming down by the same amount, right? So the working capital is going to stay the same, isn't it? Okay, so no, that's not going to affect payment of a 30-year mortgage with a cash pay, uh, payment, well, now my what? Now my current asset cash is going down and there's no other side of the equation, a current liability going down. It's what? It's a long-term liability going down. So that's actually going to do what? Actually going to decrease my working capital. Now, B, the correct answer, if I refinance account payable with a two-year no, uh, two note, the current liability is going to go down and there's what? No effect on current assets because I'm signing a two-year note. There's no further effect on current liabilities because a two-year note is what? Is considered long-term, right? Current assets are those that will be, rule of thumb, used up in a year, right? Or liquidated, I should say, for current liabilities, liquidated in a year, um, current asset used in a year. Okay, you can see why I kind of went flashcard happy on you there. It's impossible to answer questions like this if you don't even know how these are defined or calculated. Right? Okay, good, let's try this one.
Okay, guys, let's go ahead and take a look at this one. Okay. And okay, we still got um, a good chunk of us getting this right, 64%. But I get a little uncomfortable with the fact that some folks thought A, B, or C would even have a chance of being correct. So let's take a look at this one. And um, okay, which of the following transactions the correct answer is D, okay? But let's take a look at um, federal income tax payment from a previous year is paid. Um, payment due, okay, payment due from a previous period. So if we had a payment due, we had taxes payable, didn't we? And we must have debited tax expense for that. So what are we gonna, what's the journal entry when we actually pay this? Cash. Cash what? Decrease. Okay. In accounting, we have something we call debits and credits. So please speak to me in accounting. Credit, credit, cash. Okay, guys, we gotta learn how to talk journal entries here. So you give me the, what you want me to do, debit or credit first, and then you tell me the account. And I don't care if you go in order of debits and credits. So debit tax expense. I already debited tax expense. And credit cash. I already debited tax expense when I set up the payable. Debit the payable. Debit tax payable. Credit cash. And credit cash, good. Now tax payable shows up on the balance sheet, doesn't it? Does tax payable show up on the balance sheet? Current yeah. liability. Do liability show up on the balance sheet? Yep. Yes. So does tax payable show up on the balance sheet? Yes. Okay, is cash on the balance sheet? Yes. So how would that transaction possibly affect net profit? It doesn't. There is no income statement impact at all there. Okay, so that can't be right. Okay, good. Um, how about dividend payable? A dividend is paid. What's the journal entry to uh, record a dividend, cash dividend be paid. Debit credit, please. Debit, dividend, dividend payable and cash uh, credit. Okay, well, yeah, um, but I want just assume we didn't set it up as a payable, Matthew. So we just would have debited dividend and we would have credited cash when we paid it, right? Yeah. So assuming we just paid it out when we declared it, whatever, but you're right. Generally, there's a lag between the declaration date and the payment date, and then you would debit the payable and credit the uh, cash. But the reason I'm showing it to you this way, is there any income statement impact here? Nope. Well, no. Dividends are reduction, direct straight reduction to retain earnings, right? Mm -hmm. So there's no impact on profitability. C is wrong, okay? Now, it says current ratio would increase current ratio and decrease net profit. Now we've got what? Two transactions left here that could affect, affect net profit. So now my job is to figure out if it's gonna increase it, my profit or decrease it. And you look and they say, well, vacant land is sold for less than its book value. In other words, I have a piece of land that costs me a hundred, has say accumulated depreciation of say 30, therefore I'm just making these numbers up, has a book value of 70 and I sell it for what? Cash of less than the book value. So I sell it for say 60. When that happens, I'm going to do what? Debit cash, 
First six. If vacant land usually does it have depress depreciation? Oh, that's a good point. Okay, so its book value would be its cost. Thank you. It would work if they said equipment. It would be the way I'm doing it, but you're right. With land, it's just its cost, right? It costs 70. Its book value is 70. Unless that land has had some sort of impairment, I had to write it down, but let's not turn this into the far section of the course. Um, the cost is 70. Its book value is 70. And so I have cash of what, I sell it for cash of 60. So I'm gonna debit the cash 60. I'm gonna credit the land for how much? For 70. And I'm going to have to debit to make this journal entry balance. I'm gonna have to debit what? Loss. So land, my profitability is gonna come down, right? Now, B, is a little bit troublesome. I mean, you, you'd pick D for sure. B, you might not be able to fully understand what they're saying here. They say the long-term bond is retired before maturity at a discount. And I guess what they're trying to say is you retired that for less than the carrying value of that um, bond. So you had a bond that had a carrying value of you know, a hundred and you only had to pay $98 to get rid of it. Well, think of that as though you owe, you know, a million dollars on your house and somebody said, Hey, you owe a million dollars on your house. I'll tell you what, give me nine, eight, 980,000. And we'll call it even. You'd be like, great. I just, i just gained something. So that is not a loss that does not decrease profitability that situation they're trying to tell you in very poor language that they did what? That they had an increase in profitability from that transaction, okay? So that one's kind of funny the way they wrote that, but this is so clearly the right answer that you would be able to eliminate that one by D being so much better. Also, because it's long-term, you could just ignore it, right? Um, well, no, because it's going to affect profitability. I don't care if it's short term or long term. I just meant because the current ratio, doesn't that really measure like current assets or is that wrong? Well, you want to get rid of it because it wouldn't increase the current ratio. Um, but we're getting retiring the bond, but we're getting if we're retiring the bond, we're giving up cash, aren't we? That's true. So I guess it wouldn't increase the current ratio, it would decrease it. So you could eliminate it that way too, yeah. I was looking more at the profitability part, but you could do it that way too, yeah. Okay, question. Okay, guys, I think you've got a good amount of work cut out for you over the weekend, which is to finish up anything left from chapter one. We made good progress in chapter two tonight. Um, we should be able to finish that up next uh, Monday when we meet. Uh, I may see some of you tomorrow when the Security Exchange Commission comes to speak to us. So uh, if I do, I will see you then. Um, I've given you the link for that, right, in um, e-learning. The only one I still need to get you the link for, although it may end up being the same link as the PwC one, which is down the road a ways. Okay, question? No? Okay, guys. Have a good rest of the evening. I will see you potentially tomorrow, definitely on Monday, okay? Have a good uh, rest of the evening. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Thank you Professor. Bye-bye. Professor, <clears throat> can I have a question for you?